Okay, so we were talking about composition the other day. Right, sorry, just a second here. Okay. Now remember in comp, oh, wait, hang on. Uh, in composition, so if X is composed of Y, that means X has a Y object, right? So there's a field of type Y inside the X class, but it also means that X owns the Y object, right? So composition um, is the strongest form of association, right? Composition implies ownership, right? And that means um, X needs exclusive access to its Y object, right? So in other words, uh, your class X is not going to hand out a reference to its internal Y object. Um, unless the internal Y object is immutable, right? Because you don't have to worry about the state of an immutable object. Uh, so um, that means in your constructors, you have to watch out, right? So if you're asked, if you're given a Y object in a constructor, the constructor has to make copies of the incoming Y objects, right? If there's some accessor method, so if there's some method in X that re tries to return a Y object, um, then you can't return the field directly. You have to make a copy of the field and then return the copy. Uh, finally, if there's a method that takes in a Y object and then changes the state of the internal Y object, right, you can't just set a reference to the, coming, to the incoming Y object. Right? If you need to do something like that, you have to copy the object and then set a reference to the copy. Right? So all of those copies are called defensive copies, and that's actually the problem with composition. Right? So that's the price you pay with composition. You have to do a lot of copying. Um, and it's not always cheap to copy an object. Okay, so here's your default construct, uh, your no argument constructor, right? The no argument constructor doesn't change um, compared to aggregation or plain association, right? The no argument constructor still needs to make a Y object somehow, right? So there's uh, that's not there's no changes here. Uh, if you have a constructor that takes in a Y object, though, now you have a now there's something different. Right? So when you have a constructor that accepts a Y object and you want to set the internal Y object to be equal to that one, right? you want it to be equal to the incoming object, then you have to copy the object. Right? After you make your copy, you can then validate the copy. Right? And then, so that's what check Y does. Right? Uh, so check Y is a, it's some made up, function, uh, made up method here. Right, uh, you might just put the validation code um, right here, right? Um, if you have to do it a bunch of times, then it makes sense to make a method. Um, only after you validate the copy can you go ahead and um, set the reference, the internal, set the field uh, to refer to the copy. Okay, so why is that copy required? It's because uh, you're implementing a composition, right? And so X needs exclusive access to its Y object. When you write this Y equals Y, Right, you're sharing, uh, your, your field this dot y points to an existing y object that somebody else has a reference to, right? That means you don't own the, that means x doesn't own its internal object anymore, right? It's sharing uh, its internal object with somebody else, right? So when you share a reference to one of your internal objects, that's called a privacy leak, right? So sometimes it's accept, sometimes it's fine. So if you're implementing an aggregation, then it's not a privacy leak because you're not trying to be, you're not trying to hide your internal field anyway, right? Um, but if you're implementing a composition, it's problematic. Okay, so if you have a copy constructor, you have to copy the other object's Y object as, um, also, right? So you can't just write this Y equals other Y because now you're sharing your Y object with another X object. Right? You have to make a defensive copy of the other Y object and then set your internal reference to, uh, and set your field, uh, or set the field of this object to point to the copy. Right? If you write this, right? so if you write this Y equals other Y when you're implementing composition, right? uh, every X object created with a copy constructor ends up sharing its Y object. Right? So in other words, every time you call the copy constructor, you're not actually copying uh, the state of another object, right? You're sharing uh, your state with another object, right? So if one of the X objects changes its Y object somehow, then all of the X objects end up seeing the modified Y, which is a privacy leak, 
right? So you don't want that either. OK, so here's that projectile class that I showed you, I think, last lecture as well. Um, the projectile class, when we first saw it, used aggregation. Right? So if you want to use composition, right, and you're implementing the copy constructor, right, whatever you do, you can't write this position equals other position. You can't write this velocity equals other velocity. Right? Uh, you have to do something like uh, that. Right? So instead of setting this position equals the other position, right? Wait, did I do that right? Uh, wrong one, sorry. Oh, did I not put the copy constructor in here? Well, that was silly. Sorry. Um, for some reason, that copy constructor is missing. Public particle. OK, so you have to make a copy of that other position, right? And then for the velocity, you have to make a copy of that other velocity object. OK, if you have an accessor, so if you have a, an accessor method that's supposed to return uh, some information about the state of your x object, right? And in this case, it returns the y, uh, information about the y object, right? You can't just return this dot y. You have to return a copy of this dot y, right? And why do you have to do that? Again, it's all because x is supposed to own its internal y, right? When you do something like that, whoever calls get y, now has a reference to the internal y object. They can change the internal y object however they want. When they change that internal y object, your class, your object also sees that change. Right, so again, another privacy leak. Right. Uh, here, so for get position, you can't just return this position. For get velocity, you can't return this velocity. Right, uh, come on. So for get position, you have to make a copy of your internal position object and return that, right? And then get velocity, you have to make a copy of your internal vector that represents the velocity and return the copy, right? If you return the position directly, then someone can take the returned point, change the coordinates of the point, and then suddenly your particle moves, right? If you return the velocity directly, so if you just return this dot velocity, someone can take the returned vector modify the state of the vector, and then suddenly your point is moving in a different uh, direction or speed, right? Okay, uh, the same thing is true with any mutator method that you might have. So if you have a method that sets uh, the y, your internal y field, right, you have to make a copy of the incoming y object, right? Validate the copy if you have to, right? You don't always have to do validation, if there's some constraints on y, then you have to validate, right? So you check the copy. Uh, now here you don't check y, right? You don't check the incoming object, you check the copy of the object. Uh, the reason for that is if you're writing um, code in a multi-threaded environment, right? So in a multi-threaded environment, it's possible that someone calls set y, you make the copy, your program pauses, lets another thread run. While it's running, someone else changes the original y. When your, when your method starts running again, your cop, uh, if you're validating the other y, right, instead of validating the copy, the other y might not be valid anymore, right? So this is something you'll learn about uh, if you stay in computing science and you take the operating systems course, right? For now, um, you should always validate the copy after you make the copy, right? Don't validate the incoming object. Uh, and then after you validated the copy, you can set your uh, field to point to the copy, right? Again, why is it needed? All because of ownership, right? When you write this y equals y, your, your internal y field points to an another object, uh, points to an existing object, right? That somebody else has a reference to. Okay, so for the projectile class, right, you can't write this position equals 
position, and you can't write this velocity equals velocity. You have to, oh, so this is the important line. Don't worry about the return value, right? You have to set your position to be equal to a copy of the uh, incoming position, right? For the velocity, you have to set that to a copy of the incoming vector. Okay, so the defensive copies are required when you use composition, right? Um, but the price of defensive copying is the time and memory you need to make the copies, right? So every time you make a copy of an object that takes up memory, uh, it also takes up time because you have to do some computation to actually make the copy, right? Um, every time you make a copy of an object, you may have, uh, sorry, every time you make an object, at some point in time, you have to get rid of the object, right? So the garbage collector is going to come along and get rid of any copies that aren't needed. Right? And so that means there's also going to be time spent by the garbage collector cleaning up all of these excess copies. So the bouncing ball program where the ball bounce, oh, actually, I can run it on here. Let me take a look. So this is back in here. Yeah. So this is way back um, towards the beginning, um, a couple of weeks into the course. There was this little program. So this is the uh, this is basically the project this is basically using the projectile to have a bouncing ball bounce around the screen, right? Um, that ball changes position every 25 milliseconds or so, something like that, right? If you're using composition, every time you move the ball, you're making a copy of something, right? Because you're changing um, because you're changing its position, right? So the way that move works is it makes a copy of the incoming, uh, I forget what it makes a copy of. It makes a copy of, oh, it makes a copy because it returns the position of the, of the ball. So it makes a copy of its internal um, point object and then returns that, right? But it does that every 25 milliseconds. So you're making 40.2 objects every second just to move one thing on the screen, right? If the person who calls move doesn't, use the return value, then the garbage collector has to come along and get rid of the copy, right? And so you're making 40 of these every second that you're moving one thing, right? You can, imagine, you can easily imagine something like a video game or something like that where you're literally moving millions of things a second, right? That's what a modern video game does. It literally moves millions of points per second, right? You're going to be creating, in this case, 40 some odd million objects needlessly every second, right? Um, so that's the price you pay if you use composition, right? So in other words, you probably don't want to use composition unless you really have to, right? Now the question is, is when do you really have to, right? For the projectile example, you probably, if you're going to use this for something like an animation, you probably don't want to go the composition route, right? Now, the time, uh, so one of the situations where you have to use composition, so where you're going to accept or you're, you're forced to accept the price of making these copies is when you're implementing a class and the class promises something about its state, right? So in other words, your class has some sort of invariant. Right? So recall what an invariant is, right? So an invariant is a condition on the fields of an object that's always true, right? So, uh, it's a condition that the constructors in every public method of your class has to make sure is always true every time the constructor finishes or every time a method finishes, right? So your constructor ensures that the class invariant holds when the constructor is finished running. Every public method ensures that the class invariant holds when the method is finished running, right? While the method is running, the invariant doesn't have to be true, right? And similarly, while the constructor is running, the invariant doesn't have to be true. Right? But when it's done running and returns back to the caller, your invariants have to be true. So there's this class that's described. So you can either get to it online if you want to. Um, if you actually have looked at the book that the library has, um, it's item number 10, I think, in the book. Um, so in the book, the author describes this class that represents a period of time. Right, so it might be something like, uh, you might be writing like a calendar application where you want to schedule people's, uh, you want to schedule events for people, 
right? So you could create a period class. The period class has a start time and an end time, right? Now, if you're writing something like a calendaring application, it's pretty important that the start time is always before the start time, uh, end time, or the end time is always after the start time, right? So every period object has this invariant. Okay. Um, in our implementation, we're going to use this class called date, right? So this is from java.util. Um, and it's actually a very, it's one of the classes that came, I believe, with the original release of Java. So way back in Java 1, this date class came out. Um, and you can kind of tell because um, when you see how you use the class, uh, you realize that it's a really old, it has a really weird API, right? The way they use it, it's very strange. Um, but I'm going to use it anyway. So we're going to use a date to represent the start, and we're going to use a date to represent the end. Right? And I'm going to try to make sure that this invariant is always true. Right? So the start time of every period is always before uh, the end time of the period. OK. To maintain that invariant, so the problem with the date is that it's a mutable object. Right? So in other words, you, you can make a date object, and then you can change the date and time that that uh, object represents. I'm going to use composition here. So I'm going to make period to be a composition of two date objects. Right? One represents the start time, one represents the end time. Uh, there's the link to the uh, documentation for the date class. Right? Now remember, if you're implementing composition, you need some way to copy uh, the objects that make up your class. Right? So in the, all the previous slides, I've just been using the copy constructor. But if you look at the date class, there is no copy constructor, right? partly because it's a very old class. Right? So people didn't recognize the fact that copy constructors were important in the first version of Java. Right? So it didn't have one. Um, instead, you have to use this weird method called get time right? to get the, so if you want to copy D, right, you have to ask for D's time. Right? That just returns some time. It's a long value. It's the number of seconds, I think, since January 1, 1970, or something like that. Um, so you get some number here, and then you can pass that to the constructor, and that will make a copy. Uh, that will make a date object that's the same as D. Right? So it's not as simple as just passing in D. All right, so there's the start of my class. Right? So it's called period. It's got the two fields representing the start and end time. Right? Here's my constructor. So here's a constructor that takes in the start time and the end time. Right? It promises to throw an exception right? if the start time is after the end time. Right? So what do we do? Well, it looks like I have to validate these two arguments, because right? I have to make sure that start comes before end. Right? How do you compare two date objects? Well, how do you compare any two objects in Java? Right? You're probably going to use compare to. Right? Uh, so start compare to end, if it's greater than 0, right? that means that start, comes, uh, start is greater than end, is what that means. Right? So in other words, the start time is after the end time. Right? So we throw an exception. And then I write this start equals start, and I write this end equals end. Right, so right away that looks like um, plain aggregation, uh, plain association or aggregation. Right, so all I've done is make uh, my internal fields start and end aliases for some other object. Right, now if you do that, you can break this class. Right, so remember that period has an invariant. Right, period says that the start time is always after the end time. Right, here in the constructor, I even check if the start time uh, is after the end time, and I throw an exception. Right? But you can write one more line of code. Right? So you can write a line of code right here that causes the invariant uh, for period to no, no longer hold. Right? And you don't even have to access the period class directly. Right? So in other words, I don't have to write p dot something. Right? I don't have to call a method on the, object, on the period object. Right? Uh, it looks like I can just fiddle around with the end time or the start time. Right? Um, so, you can break this, um, you can break the invariant by making the end time come before uh, the start time. 
or making the start time come after the end time. Right. So you can kind of guess that set time is going to set the time to whatever that, uh, that value is. Right. So end set time to end get time. You can kind of guess that's not going to do anything. Right. It's going to set the end time to the current end time. Right. End set time to end get time plus 10,000. Right. So that moves the end time 10,000 units into the future. Right. So that's probably not, that's not a problem. Right. Start set time to end get time minus one makes the start time, I think, one second. It's either one second or one millisecond. I don't remember what. Uh, which one? Before the end time. So that's not a problem. Right. But the last one sets the end time to the start time. Right. So in other words, the start time is not before the end time anymore. Right. Now the weird thing is you're doing it with end and you're using end and start. Right? So you're using end and start here. You're not actually accessing a field of p. Right? But because p dot start is start, right? and p dot end is end, right? d causes the period, uh, to, uh, causes the period class to no longer uh, be able to guarantee that its invariant is true. Right? In other words, line d will, in fact, if you ask period, the period object p for its end and start time, Right? When you use end to change the end time, the period's end time will actually change. Right? So in this case, it's D. Right? D will cause uh, the invariant to no longer hold. So how do you fix it? Well, you have to use composition. Right? How do you use composition? You have to copy the incoming objects. Right? So the first thing you do is you copy uh, the start time and end time. Right? Then you check is the copied start time, does it come after the copied end time? Right? If it does, you throw an exception. Right? And if it doesn't, now you can set this start equal to the copy, and you can set this end equal to the copy. OK, here's the copy constructor. Right? So I'm going to copy another period object. Right? And I'm going to write the copy constructor um, as though this was plain association or aggregation. Right? So this start equals other start. This end equals other end. Right? right? That's going to break. Right? So if you do this, every period object made with the copy constructor has the same start time object and the same end time object. Right? It's the same object. They're not separate, uh, you no longer have separate period objects, right? You're sharing the start time and end time. So if one of the period objects changes its start time, they all change their start time, right? If one of the period objects change their end time, they all change their end time, right? So to fix this, to make sure that you use composition, you have to copy, right? The, others, uh, the other date's start time, you have to copy the other date's end time. When you write a copy constructor, you never have to do any validation, right? So when you write a copy constructor, you don't do validation because you're copying another object anyway, right? You're copying another object of the same type, right? If you've done your work correctly everywhere else, right, the object that you're copying is never invalid anyway, right? Uh, so in your copy constructor, there's normally not any validation. Right, so I don't have to check whether the other class, the other period object start time is after, is before its end time. Okay, now if you are implementing this, uh, this period class, right, anybody who's using this period class probably wants to get the start time of a period and they probably want to get the end time of a period. Right? Do you probably want a method called get start? You probably want a method called get end or start and end or something like that. Right? If you simply return this dot start and this dot end, right, you've now handed out a reference to your internal um, start and end times. Right? Anybody who gets a reference to those can change the start and end time. Right? So to fix that, make a copy of your internal start time first and then return the copy. You can write, uh, yeah, that's right. And then for the end time, Right? Make a copy of your internal end time object, 
and then return the copy. Okay, and then we have a mutator method here. So here's a method that takes in a, starting, a new starting time, right? So you want to change the start time of your period object. So it takes in a new date, right? It takes in a, new, uh, it takes in a date called new start that represents the new starting time, right? This is using plain old aggregation, right? Because I'm going to set this start equal to new start here, right? I do the validation correctly, right? So I actually check, is the new start time, does it come after, is it less than, sorry, so does it come before the current end time, right? If it does, I go ahead and set this start to new start and I set okay to true, right? If the new start time comes after the current end time, then I simply return false and I don't change the start time, right? So the validation's correct. Uh, but the composition's broken because of that line right there. So how do you fix it? Well, you got to make a copy, right? This is basically the copying lecture where you have to copy stuff, right? So if you want to change the start time, you have to copy the incoming start time. Check the copy, right? Check to see that the copy is in fact okay, right? So does the copy come before the current end time? Right? If so, I can set the start time to be equal to the copy, right? and then set OK to true. OK, so everything uh, that I've been showing you, these are all examples of privacy leaks. Right? So if you're implementing a composition, you're always worried about leaking a reference to one of your internal objects. Right? Uh, so if you have primitive fields, you don't care about returning primitive fields, right? You don't make a copy of a primitive field and then return it, right? Because Java returns everything by value anyway, right? So Java takes the value of, the ob of a primitive field and returns that back to the caller, right? The caller can't do anything to change the internal primitive field of an object, right, with, the co with, the, uh, with a value. If you have an immutable field, you can just return, the immut uh, you can just return a reference to the immutable field. Right? Because immutable field, you can't change its value, uh, you can't change the state of an immutable field anyway. Right? The object's immutable, its state can't change. Right? So you don't care about primitive and immutable um, objects. Right? You just hand out, refer you hand out references to immutable objects without, uh, without caring about it. Right? You hand out copies of primitive fields without caring. Right? So th those don't matter. The only time composition matters is when you have, uh, is when you're making an object and inside that object, there's a reference to an object who, uh, that's mutable, right? So for example, with the period class, date's mutable, right? With the projectile class, point and vector two are both mutable, right? So if you're implementing a composition, right, uh, and the, your composite object has type Y, Y is mutable, right? Then you have to make sure you don't do any of the four down there. Right? So in other words, you can't set your internal Y object to be an alias for somebody else's Y object. Right? You can't set your internal Y object to be the alias for another X object's Y object. Right? You cannot hand out a reference to your internal Y object. Right? And similarly here, you can't set your internal Y object to refer to an existing Y object. Right? You have to make copies of everything, otherwise, your composition's broken, right? So what happens when you have a privacy leak, right? So a privacy leak essentially lets some other object control the state, uh, control the internal state of your object, right? So if X is supposed to be a composition of a Y and X has a privacy leak, right? Somebody else, not X, right, now has control over the state of X. Right? So in the period class, if someone gets a, a reference to the start or end time, right, they can use that reference to change the start and end time of the period object. Right? If the period object promises something about its state, right, it can no longer guarantee that that promise is true. Right? So in other words, the state of an object can become inconsistent with respect to its invariance. Right? So now it becomes possible for a period object to have a start time that comes after the end time. 
right? If you're implementing a credit card class, for example, and you expose a reference to its uh, expiry date, right? then anybody who gets a hold of that reference can change the expiry date of your credit card. Right? You probably don't want that to happen. Right? Uh, uh, so I, actually, I just said this before in the previous slide. Right? So if your class has invariance and you have a privacy leak, uh, your class no longer has any meaningful invariance. Right? Because it can't guarantee that they're true. Right? So if period exposes a reference to one of its date objects, right? Um, then somebody else can arrange for the, uh, can set up a situation where the, your period object has a start time that comes after the end time. Right, so now your invariants no longer hold. Sorry, a second here. Okay. Right, so if you have a privacy leak, you no longer have a composition, right? You now have effectively uh, an aggregation or an association, right? Uh, and this is problematic too because composition is supposed to imply ownership, right? So if you have, an ob if you have a class that, represent, uh, that implements a composition, uh, so let's call the class X, right? If you make an X object and then the X object, uh, you're no, you no longer need it, so it dies, right? Um, then all of its internal parts are supposed to die with it, right? So if, you have, if X is a composition of a Y, when the X object goes away, the Y object also goes away, right? But if somebody else has a reference to that internal Y object, that Y object doesn't go away, right? The, uh, because the garbage collector can't get rid of it because someone has a reference to it, right? Uh, that can be a problem because um, you may end up with a bunch of, uh, someone can set up a situation where you make a bunch of X objects, right? And the X objects are never used, but the Y objects never go away, and you end up running out of memory. Right? Okay. Uh, now, there is, um, if you use immutable objects, right, as your building blocks for your class, uh, then you don't have to worry about um, composition, right? So if all of the fields of your object are immutable, you don't care about composition anymore. Right? Uh, so making immutable classes or immutable objects um, um, turns out to be a useful thing. Right? So how do you make an immutable object? Right? So I want to make an object whose state can never change. Right? So obviously, step number one, right, you're not going to put any methods into your class where the, that alter the state of the object. Uh, step number two, we're going to get to next week. Step number three, um, so in your immutable class, you want to make all your fields final, right? The reason you want to do that uh, is because you can only set the field once, right? Your object's immutable anyway, so you only ever have to set the field once, right? So you want to make the fields final. That prevents anybody else, um, if they're able to get a reference to that field, uh, from setting that field to something else. Sorry. Um, that's not what it means. So that prevents you from internally in your class accidentally changing the value of your field. Right. You want to make all your fields private. So this is the thing that prevents everybody, anybody else from getting access to that field directly. Right? So make all your fields private, but you're doing that anyway for the most part. Right? And number five, Whatever you do, right, if you happen to have, if your immutable object happens to have mutable fields, right, you have to make sure nobody gets a reference to one of those mutable fields, right? So this is the other place that you have to worry about composition, right? You're making an immutable object, right, but one of your fields happens to be mutable. Whatever you do, you cannot hand out a reference to that field. Right? Otherwise, your class is no longer uh, immutable. Okay. Um, so everything I've talked about so far uh, is composition. So er all the stuff I've talked about with, res with respect to composition, it's been a field that represents one object. Right? Uh, but it's very often the case that you make a class, and it's one or more of its fields are a collection. Right? 
So for example, you might have, a, uh, you might have an array as one of your fields. Right? Uh, this complicates what it means to be a composition. Right? Uh, why does it complicate that? Because you now have to decide, does your object own the array, or list, or set, or map? Right? Or does your object own the stuff that's inside the list, or set, or map, or both? Right? So now you have a problem. Right? You, you have a class. It's got a collection that holds multiple things. Does it own the multiple things or not? Or does it just own the collection? Right? So if you have an array and its elements are all primitive, right, uh, then that's much easier to deal with than having an array uh, where the elements have reference type. Right? Do, 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 do. OK, so let's take a look at an example where we're implementing composition with an array. I think this is going to be an array of primitive type. Yeah, so it's an array of primitive type. Right. So I want to implement a combination lock class. Right. So you're, it's a lock. Um, it has a combination made up of three digits. All the digits are between 0 and 9. Right. And uh, the lock makes the promise that the lock is always uh, locked or unlocked. Right. So it has three digits. Uh, you could get away with making three separate fields, one for each digit. Right? Uh, but I'm going to use an array here. Right? They're integer values, so I'm going to use an array of int. Right? And then um, it's a lock, so I need to know is the lock locked or unlocked. Right? I'm going to have a Boolean field to represent the state of the lock. OK. Uh, so I have a combination lock. For some reason, I'm going to compare locks. I don't know why, but I'm going to do it anyway, probably because we just talked about comparable. Right. I have my field that represents the combination. Right. So this is going to be an array of length 3. Uh, and I have a field is locked. It's true. If the, if the lock is locked, it's false otherwise. OK. When you create an array um, as a field, right, that field right here, if you don't do anything else in the class, uh, that field, there's no array yet. right? The thing combination, that the, the name combination currently is null. Right? So there's actually, uh, that field has not been initialized yet. Right? So an array is, like a, is not like a primitive value. Right? If you have a primitive value that's a field and you don't initialize it, it gets the value 0 or false. Right? Um, if you have an array, you end up with an array that's null. So you, your constructor has to make a new array. So there's my default construct, uh, my no argument constructor. The no argument constructor says it sets the combination to 999. Right? So you have to make the array here. Right? Set each value of the array to 9. Uh, and then apparently we're going to set the state of the lock to be locked. Right? The constructor takes in a combination from outside uh, and makes a copy of that combination. Right? So it make, takes in a com, it takes in an array of int, right? Now it's this is uh, the lock. Um, lock's going to be a composition, right? Because it's um, in this case it's a composition because it's trying to hide uh, its combination from from outside, right? So you don't want to release a reference to the internal array because then somebody can see the combination, right? Similarly, if I want to change the combination of the, if the lock needs to change its combination, right, it needs an independent array to be holding the, com uh, to hold the combination, right? So the, the approach is the same both times, right? And no matter, what, no matter what you do, right? You're taking in some reference type, right? You have to make a copy of it, right? So the first thing I do is make a copy of the incoming combination. Right? There's lots of ways you can do this. The easiest way is to use arrays copy of. Right? So copy that array uh, and copy the array so that it has that length. Right? And then um, you're going to check the combination. So this actually doesn't complete, this is not complete validation. Uh, so I'm going to check is the combination length uh, less than three, and uh, otherwise I'm going to throw an exception. The other thing you really should do here uh, is you really should check uh, 
uh, that the combination has, uh, the digits are between 0 and 9. Right? So there should be another little loop here where you check, or you, I guess you, you don't need the loop, but you should check if the three values are between 0 and 9. If they're not, you should throw an exception. Right? Only after I make the copy and check the copy can I set the combination to be equal to the copy. Right? Whatever you do, don't write this combination equals combination. Right? Because now you don't have a new array. Right? Instead, the combination locks array points to the other, points to the incoming array. Okay, the copy constructor has to make a copy as well, right? So in this case, uh, the easiest way to do this is to use constructor chaining, right? So when I copy the other uh, combination, whoops, sorry, right? When I copy another combination lock, I can just call the other constructor. Right? Because the other constructor does the validation anyway. Uh, sorry, the other constructor does the copying anyway. Right? So when you chain to the other constructor, it just calls this constructor, passing in the other locks combination. Right? The price you pay here is that you have to do so, you repeat the validation even though you don't have to. Right? You don't have to validate this locks combination, assuming you've done everything else correctly anyway. Right? Because that other lock should have a valid combination. All right. Now, just because you're implementing a, a, a composition, right, that does not mean you have to make a, de a defensive copy everywhere. Right? You only need to make the defensive copy when there's the danger of um, releasing a reference to an internal field. Right? So if you unlock the lock, Right? So unlocking the lock requires the caller to pass in a combination to try to unlock this lock with. Right? The array that's coming in, you're not going to use that to set, your, uh, to set the combination. Right? So you don't have to make a copy of the incoming array. Right? You can just use the array as it stands. Right? So here, right? so someone's going to try to unlock the lock with another combination. Right? There is an array coming in to the method, right? But you're not going to use the combination to set your internal combination, right? So I don't have to copy it here, right? There's no need to copy that thing here, even though this is a composition, right? So in composition, it's not blind copying everywhere, right? It's only copy when you have to, right? So how can I check if that combination is equal to my combination? Well, there's arrays equals, right? Arrays equals deals with all the stuff that might be wrong with this, right? So if, it's a, if it has the wrong length, you'll get false, right? If the values are different, you'll get false, right? So only if that thing has the, right, has the same length as your internal combination and has the same values will arrays equals uh, return true, right? So if it returns true, I'm just going to unlock the lock. So I'll just set this is locked to false. Oh, that's it. Um, there's probably more to that. Uh, but for now, that's it for, uh, that's it for today. Uh, right. Anybody have any questions about composition? Mm, all right. Um, so I will see you on Monday. Um, the assignment date's probably going to, so the, you have an assignment that's due on Monday. It's probably going to move um, because apparently Monday is the day after Halloween. Um, so I was asked to move CISC 220's assignment date, so I will move this one as well.